Matthew 20. <clears throat> okay, kind of took a break from this. Um, uh, this is uh, an idea that I gave a couple of weeks back. Love, lead, and serve thy neighbor. The second commandment of the ten, love thy neighbor as thyself. And so I want to kind of finish this up. Uh, serving thy neighbor. And that's anybody that's within your sphere of influence. In Matthew 20, you see it's dealing with uh, a, a somebody working for somebody. And uh, since that is, uh, for an adult, the workplace is the majority of your awake time. And so the Bible has much admonitions about this. Matthew 20, uh, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, uh, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So obviously it's uh, like an orchard. It's time of harvest. Uh, so they're hiring a bunch of Mexicans to come in because the white folk won't do the work. Uh, but it's that type, if it's a type where you got to get the job done. <clears throat> and when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Okay, don't allow the penny of today to influence our thinking. A penny in the Bible is a day's wage. So in our culture, depending on how, many hour, how much you get paid per hour, so he made an agreement and uh, with the laborers. He went out again about the third hour, so about 9 o'clock in the morning, saw others standing idle in the marketplace, said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Now, I notice there's not a specific agreement here on the cost, <clears throat> the trade. Again, he went out about the sixth hour, so noon, ninth hour, three, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, so five, so they're really trying to rush this order in. Uh, he went out and found others standing idle, saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They, said unto, they say unto him, Because no man hath hired us, he, hath, he saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come... The Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, uh, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came, there were hired about, about the eleventh hour. <clears throat> they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had <clears throat> received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying that, these last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. They didn't like the idea. He answered one of them, said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not, <clears throat> didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful? For me to do what I will with mine own? Of course, the libs don't think so. Is not thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many, uh, for many be called, but few are chosen. In Alaska, many are cold, but few are frozen. Okay, and so let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand this idea. Help us understand uh, that uh, folks uh, working in the workplace can... Uh, elevate their work. Uh, it may be a drag of a job, but yet they could also bring you in the middle of it, and it can become a life's ministry. And help us to understand this idea in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, uh, a while back I showed that uh, we all live by contracts. Okay, and I, then I gave elements of the contract. We're going to go through that a little bit again here. Uh, but this is a matter of serving thy neighbor. So the first one I was mostly focused on, love thy neighbor. The next one is lead thy neighbor. Leading is not tyranny. It's not lordship. Uh, it's a gentle way of being an example to others. And then this is serving. Now, serving thy neighbor in this context is mostly going to be in the workplace. Now, Paul wants us to know about these things. And he, and he taught and he admonished several churches that you need to know this. Now, if a child 
learns in the home as they're being raised to serve, if they learn that in the home, to serve to work, that work is a good thing, then this can be transferred out of the home when they go into the workforce. And if they transfer that good work ethic, uh, there are people who own businesses, when they see that good work ethic, they will do anything to keep that person. Okay, in this stage where people can't even show up to work, and they think that this is work, um, then they're not going to really understand what work is. Okay, and so it's actually, if they're following this idea, a person, if the liberty continues and things like that, then uh, they will never want for a job. Or if they happen to uh, lose a job, they'd be able to get one very quickly. Now, the Bible is laid out in, in two divisions, uh, two testaments. Testaments are like a covenant. A covenant is our word for contract. Okay, and this is how we live. Okay, a contract involves, has several elements, involves two or more parties. Uh, an offer is presented. This offer is given some stipulations, and then the party who uh, agrees with the offer, they have a meeting of the minds. They express a full understanding. And then when they accept the offer, that's what makes the contract valid. Most of our contracts are verbal are understood, okay, and they, most of them are very short-lived. Usually, if a contract must last for more than a year, you're advised to put it in writing. <clears throat> now, this is what God did in the matter of salvation. Uh, Jesus Christ, okay, has offered freely to anyone the gift of salvation, now, a person must accept that offer. Now, the meaning of the minds is that this offer is uh, it's free. Okay? And when a person places their faith in Christ, they've accepted the offer. It's worthy of all acceptations. And then God finished out the contract from his written word. That's an actual written contract. So I'm going to give you some ideas this morning about how to serve Okay, thy neighbor, but in essence, serve your Savior, no matter what occupation you have. Okay, this idea, sometimes if you go to conferences or whatever, preachers talk about full-time Christian service. But I don't really buy into that totally, because I, I truly believe that um, when a person works in what's called secular work, which I don't buy into... Uh, it can become spiritual when you bring Jesus Christ in the middle of it. Okay, and the first thought is this. Paul exhorted to teach about the proper service to thy neighbor. And I'm going to read several places to show this. Ephesians chapter 6. He mentioned this four times at least. Once to the church in Ephesus. Now, in chapter 5, you see he's dealing with the family. At the beginning of chapter 6, he's dealing with the family again, about the children. But then in verse 5, he picks up uh, your attitude in the workplace. Okay, verse 5, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Now, our term, we don't use servants in our term. Okay, our term, I guess you could say employees. I do understand the deceptive means of that. But still, the idea is you're serving somebody. The master would be the owner, okay, or a, a corporation, which is still owned by an individual, so it's still run by a man, even though the corporate entity has its legal aspects about it. Okay, but anybody that a person... Uh, goes to try to get into the workplace. The Bible says you're a servant and be obedient unto them. If you're not gonna, if you don't like the agreement, if you don't like the job, if you don't like the service, then leave. Okay. And if there's nothing else to, that you got figured out before you leave, you better just learn to uh, do your duty and enjoy it. Okay. But still, he, and then he gives some qualities here. He says. Um, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. So the attitude is, okay, serve them like that individual's Jesus Christ. You say, well, they don't act like it. Obviously, 
He says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters. Okay, now he's got one verse directed at the owner. And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings. Now, anybody that's in the workplace knows that most foremans get their way by bossing people around, by bullying them. Direct contrary to the Bible. And the reason why they do that is because that's how Gentiles think that you lead people. You lead them by being strong. You step on their face if they don't do what you're supposed to do. No, the Bible's got different methods on these things. And when a person does follow the Bible methods of leadership, they will see that uh, they will not have a big turnover in workers. They will have people sticking around. Hey, I'm treated better here than other places. Why would I want to leave? Okay, so that's directed at the owner. And then he says this, Knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respective persons with him. The implications of that is if you employ people that you need to uh, uh, treat them uh, properly uh, because you're going to be treated the same way in front of God. Okay, now that was Ephesus. Now he gave some of the same ideas to the church in Colossae. You'll find that in Colossians chapter 3. What I'm telling you is that Paul wanted this taught in the church. Colossians chapter 3 Verse 22. Again, as you can see, that this does follow a couple of admonitions for the family structure. In verse 22, servants be, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Okay, singleness of heart, one mind, following the wishes of the company or whatever. And whatever you do, do it heartily. And then it says, as to the Lord and not unto men. So put your heart into it. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Now you serve the Lord Christ, even though your servant may be an unsaved owner. You're still serving the Lord when you bring him into the middle of it. 25, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Okay, then he advised Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter... Now, Timothy, remember, was a young fellow that Paul had led to Christ and then discipled him, and Timothy became a pastor. And so he said to Timothy, you need to teach this to your people. 1 Timothy 6, verse 1. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now, that raises the stakes there. A person would never think that, <clears throat> but that raises the stakes there. And they that have believing masters, so maybe your boss is a, is a believer in Jesus Christ. Let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved Partakers of the benefit. Benefit, that's where we get the idea of a job benefits. These things teach and exhort. Okay, so I'm following that admonition. Okay, two letters later to Titus. Titus was another young fellow that Paul had won to Christ and discipled, and he also became a pastor. Okay, now Titus 2 verse 9, he has some very <coughs> interesting details here. <clears throat> Excuse me, Titus 2 verse 9, <clears throat> if obeyed, if obeyed to its highest, anybody who gets a job and obeys these two verses, they will, uh, they will be a great testimony to the boss, the owner, to the foreman, okay, to the people who do the hiring. And these people will always want to maintain or keep this type of a person on a job. If there's going to be a layoff, they're going to do all they can to keep this individual. Okay, Titus 2, verse 9. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters. Okay, same idea. And to please them well in all things. Okay, pretty much the same idea. Then he adds, not answering again. Okay, that's not being a smart mouth. 
That's not arguing. Well, this way it's going to be done. Well, I think it's going to be done this way. Well, uh, write your opinion on a card and I'll give it to somebody who cares. Write all you know in this one little one inch square box, all you know, and then I'll give that to somebody who cares. Okay, now the idea of not answering again. Now, if you have a, a good relationship and you do feel that your idea might be more efficient, then you could humbly appeal to the person, explain your thought. And they may say, yeah, but I still want to do it this way. What is our attitude? Well, you idiot, you ought to do what I say. No, you just say, okay, you're the boss. You say, well, it's going to cost them more money. That's their choice. It doesn't matter. And then he says, not purloining. Okay, so that one you got to kind of figure out what that means. Uh, purloining is theft. It's, another, it's an old English word for theft, which is commonly committed by employees of a business. I mean, you talk about the utter height of stupidity and ingratitude of stealing from the one who's giving you a job. I mean, it's like you're entitled to it. Take a hike, pal. Okay, not purloining. And then he says, but showing all good fidelity. Now, there's another word that's very unusual. It's an old English word. Fidelity is a careful, exact, and honest performance of service. It's as if you are working for yourself. It's as if a contractor who builds a house for somebody else versus the same contractor who builds a house for himself. He's obviously going to do a better job for himself. Okay, and so that's fidelity. A careful, exact, honest performance of work. Now, when a person does that, it says this, that they... That's the masters, the owner, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now, if a person works like that, I would dare say, I don't care what kind of boss it is. I don't care if it's an unsaved boss. I don't care if he's saved. I don't care if he's an atheist. I don't care if he's a, you know, whatever. Every single owner of a business Every single person who hires somebody wants a person to obey those two verses. Every one of them do. Now, if they would approach a person that did do that and work like that, and they said, boy, I really appreciate how you work. I appreciate your work ethic. I appreciate your conscientious. I appreciate your um, initiative uh, and your faithfulness to the task. I want to thank you for that. And you could, at that point, say, well, I, I really appreciate your kindness expressed to me, but would you like to know why I do this? Well, yeah, sure, I'd like to do it. It's because of the God of the Bible. The Bible admonishes this to me. Jesus Christ is pleased. And they might go, <laughs> okay. Now, they may not want the God of your Bible, but they are going to, they're, you're giving credit to whom credit is due. God will be blessed by that. And if they think about that, you've sown a seed. If they think about that, maybe if they, if they would come to the Lord, then God gets more glory out of that. Now, if we're a lazy scumbag in a job, griping about everything, moaning and whining, okay, and then if you say, well, the reason why I'm like this is because I'm a Christian, they're going to say, well, I know where I'm not going. Okay, and so this is the best way, according to the Bible, to witness to people on the job. Now, okay, let's say you're working on a job where your work ethic is making somebody on the job look bad. And they don't like that. Oh, and they and express their dislike of that. I'd just say, well, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry you feel that way. But I'm just following what the Bible says and... If you're going to be the way you are, that's your choice, but I'm going to be the way I am, and that's my choice. And there's another way to witness to somebody, hopefully bringing them un under conviction because they're actually stealing from the people that they've agreed, made an agreement to work for. Okay, so the employer or the servant, or uh, the employee or the servant serves the owner as unto the Lord according to the Bible. And that is the best form of witnessing. 
Okay, and the employer who represents God to his servants or employees, then he is going to stand before God and give an account of how he treated people. Now, if an owner cannot, if an owner notices that in his workplace there's a constant turnover, if he's honest with himself, he would probably have to say, well, I must be doing something wrong. Okay, it's not like the guy who's driving the wrong way on a one-way street where he says, man, look at all these idiots driving the wrong way. Okay, what about if I look at myself? I must be too harsh with them. I must not be kind to them. I must not have a good workplace for them. Why would they be wanting to leave? And, of course, this is why the rise of labor unions came about is because corporations or owners do not give properly to their workers. And so then you have the rise of the labor union. And then you've got the abuse of the labor unions. So it's, it's a, a dog-eat-dog thing. So the first thing Paul said, he exhorted to teach about proper service to thy neighbor. The second thing, the owner of a business or company has the right, according to the Bible, to operate according to his pleasure. Now, if you would, go back to Matthew 20, and I'll show you what I mean. Now, people don't understand this idea of liberty. If a black man owns a store, and he puts a sign out front and says, Whitey's not allowed, he has a right to do that. Absolute right. Now, I know if I, if I reverse that, people would really get all upset. Okay, if, if, if he's the owner and he says, I want to hire only black people who are left-handed and discriminate against right-handed people, that's his right. Why? Because he's the owner. He can operate according to his pleasure. You say that's discrimination. Tough apples. That's his Right. He can discriminate. Why well, want chocolate milk? I'm discriminating against white milk because chocolate milk matters. <laughs> so that's our right as individuals. Okay? And so that's the hypocrisy that's going on in our country. Equal rights is a very ignorant thing to do to run to government to try to get it. It's a foolish thing because the only way they can give you your rights is to steal it from somebody else. Okay, if a company, they pay for everything, it's their wealth that they're risking, they have a right to make the agreements as they choose. American, um, Matthew chapter 20. Let's see the agreement. Okay, we're looking for a contract. Okay, there's a man as a householder. There's one party. He's looking for laborers. There's two or more parties. So we have the first element. What does the laborer do? He puts an offer out there. The offer is you give me of your time in labor and I will give you this currency in, in return. That's the offer. The person who understands the offer says, okay, now do I understand correctly? If I put in 12 hours work, then you're going to give me my uh, day's wage, penny, day's wage. And he says, yes, that's the agreement. And the person says, okay, I agree. So he goes to work. And then uh, at 9 o'clock, he goes out and finds his other folks. Now you'll see that he doesn't make the agreement of the penny, in their mind, they're probably saying he's going to prorate it. Okay, but then it got to the end of the day, he paid each of them a penny. Now, who's griping about it? The ones who made the agreement. If you didn't like the agreement, then what do you got to gripe about? You made the agreement. They say, well, I don't agree with his method. Tough! That's his choice. When you have your own company, then you run it the way you think it should be run. That is his absolute right. And he even made that statement where he said, verse 15 in question, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? That's my lawful right. Okay, now, where did this idea come from? It came from the Bible. 
In our, uh, the Bible teaches the private ownership of property. You know, we had, there's a business over here. And there are people parked in our parking lot. Three, four cars. So it's during place time, I'm thinking, we've got to have these parking spots. I just put a little note out there, a little note on the car, please do not park here. Boy, we got a call for that. Oh, were they mad? But it's public property. No, it's private property. It's like they think they own the world. That's this entitlement age. I have a right to health care. No, you have a right to die. That's your right. I have a right to this. I have a right to that. No, you don't. No, you don't. Now, this idea of the freedom that we have. In the Declaration of Independence, it says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, now, we got to run back to their day and discover what they mean by pursuit of happiness. Okay, what they meant, if you go back to read some things that Thomas Jefferson wrote... What pursuit of happiness meant was the private ownership of property. If they would have said life, liberty, and the private ownership of property, that would have been redundant in their mind. what What are they saying? The philosophy is the birth of America understood that property was everything. From your name, your reputation, to your land. Your freedom of speech is your property. Your choice of religion and your political affiliation is your property. Your intellectual achievements is your property and you can patent them and copyright them to protect your property. Your choice of how to make a living is your property. Your choice of social associations That's your property. That's your sovereignty. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, that is the property of every living man and woman. And they got that idea from the Bible. You see, and the owner of a business or property has the right to operate according to his wishes. And that includes the right of discrimination. That includes their right. We got a distorted viewpoint about all these things. Okay, in Detroit, Michigan, they wanted to have a symphony orchestra years ago. They did not want anybody to interpret anything by race. So what they did is they put a huge curtain up. They put thick carpet down so you couldn't tell if it was a fat or skinny person. All they did was listened to the person playing the instrument. And then they chose according to the quality of the instrument, of the playing. When he got done, he didn't have one tan individual in the bunch. Not one African American in the bunch in Detroit, Michigan. Detroit, Michigan said, we are not going to provide funding until you put some African Americans on it. What is that? That's racism. What does that do? That incites more racial hatred. Why? A person said, you only got choice because of the color of your skin. The biggest promoters of racial hatred is the government policy and the national news industry. Those are the biggest promoters. You know who are the biggest uniters of it? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the biggest uniter. I mean, when, when people of different races get together and they start bragging about Jesus Christ, man, there's a nice, nice be around. You see, why? Because we're looking at Jesus Christ. But see, in the Bible, in the Bible, this guy actually said to them, what are you complaining about, verse 23? When they griped, verse 12, he said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? You agreed. You see these athletes that get paid multi-millions of dollars. He goes up to the plate. He strikes out. Does he, does he give his money back? No. They make an agreement. And then two years later, they're griping. Right, I'm going to hold out. I'm going to hold out. I'm going to hold out. Oh, I wish they'd just let them starve to death. 
and they actually gripe about mistreatment. Where in the world can a black man fail by striking out a hundred times in a season and still get paid millions of dollars? In the land of the free and home of the brave. Not I appreciate it. These people that March lacks said, I mean, you talk about a bunch of nutheads. Vulgar, wicked, perverse people. I mean, just amazing way these people act now. Why? They've got a mental of entitlements. Who started the entitlement word? A guy in the 1990s named Bill Clinton. He's the one who started the term, entitlements. You see, and the thing is, is the best way that we can, as far as in the workplace, and that is the time where you use most of your awake hours for the adults, people in the workforce, the best way that we witness is to give an honest performance of work. And if a guy's a contractor, and if he gives a good product at a good price, people will, they, man, they will seek that out on all those things. This is a way of pleasing God Almighty. If you would look in Ephesians chapter 4, this takes whatever work that a person does and brings it into a high calling for God. And it makes the Monday mornings, instead of a drag, realize that, hey, I am actually doing something for my Savior and for my family at the same time. Ephesians 4, verse 1, he says this, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Notice he didn't say what that was. Could be a truck driver. Okay, could be uh, working in any job a person can get on. Okay, with all lowliness of, uh, and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Got to do that on a job. Put up with people. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in a bond of peace. Okay, this brings our everyday life, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, everything becomes a ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that a person should be witnessing on the job verbally, unless it's a job where you can talk and work at the same time. If you can't talk and chew gum at the same time, then I, you know, I'd be careful. But depending on the type, now, if, obviously, if it's a job like, you know, in Nipsco, you give, you know, four hours work for eight hours pay, or two hours work for eight hours pay, or state highway, one hours work for eight hours pay. I mean, whatever they do, I mean, what's uh, yellow and sleep six? You know, a Nipsco truck, anybody knows that around here. Uh, I mean, uh, that's how, I mean, if you get paid for sleep, man, you got a great job. Whatever the agreement is that you have with the boss, fulfill the agreement with a good spirit and a good heart. And recognize that people are watching you, especially when they find out you're a believer. I hope you're not an undercover believer. But when they find out, and then you witness for him, and you're a good testimony to the ones above you, And the benefit is that, man, they'll do everything to keep you on the job. They'll stand up for you. They'll fight for you to keep that kind of work ethic in their job. And in the same time, we're pleasing our God Almighty. We're pleasing Him. And that's what it's all about, is to please that blessed God that we have. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us realize that every single day is a spiritual day for the believer. No matter what kind of work it is. I mean, some that call it secular work. It is not secular for a saved man. It's a spiritual work. And hopefully that that work is not only providing the needs for our families, but it's also providing a blessing to you in that we're a testimony not only by our words, but by our example. And help us to recognize what liberty really is about, as the Bible teaches And Lord, I pray you'd help us to express gratitude. People that have work and somebody who risk their wealth to try to get some work out of others, I pray that you'd help us to express gratitude to them. Write a note of appreciation, thanking them for the opportunity to make a living, to work. And I'll probably faint. But Lord, it's a testimony that we can give to others that it's a blessing and pleasing to thee. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. We're dismissed with that.